We know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In the gospel reading we just heard chanting, we heard of the pearl of great price. That's how we refer to it. A man who found a pearl and sold all that he had to receive it. And so we can certainly see this as a metaphor for obtaining what we know in our Lord Jesus Christ. In him we see that ultimate beauty that we have been longing for. It's the one thing that will fill the void in our hearts. It's the one thing that will give us rest. It's worth giving up everything to find that beauty, that wholeness. We can also look at this parable another way. That Jesus is the one who seeks you, the pearl of great price. I was very moved one day when I heard Jonathan Jackson speak on this very idea. Jonathan Jackson, is an, you may or may not know, is an actor who became a convert and developed a, quite a robust Christian ministry. And he said that Jesus is going to seek you as if you were the only person who ever lived. He was willing to sell everything for you and saw that you have such value in you that he paid the ultimate price for your love. God and man, he says, are searching for each other, and so we have a great cosmic romance. Christ searching for the beautiful jewels that you are as we seek a savior to restore the fallen image in us. But we can add, he, God, is the only one who can bring this romance to fruition. And that frames our epistle reading today. We know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose in everything. So here it says, everything works together for those who are called according to his purpose. And I just want to deal with a question that may come to mind in light of this, because is this, as everything, I mean, many things that happen to us in a fallen world seem simply bad. And so is this for his purpose or our purpose? St. Clement in the fifth century asks this question. He says, to be called according to God's purpose is to be called according to the will. But is this the will of the one who calls or the will of the one who is called? Well, naturally, he says, and this is, anticipates what comes later in, in, our, in Paul's passage. Naturally, every impulse which leads to righteousness comes from God the Father. Christ himself once said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Nevertheless, it is not wrong to say that when some are called according to God's purpose, he does this according to their own intentions as well. So to be clear, his purpose is for your good, so that your ultimate desire will be fulfilled, no less than that, ever. So God, in this passage, says he wants you to be justified. All those he called, he will justify which means a court being conformed according to his image, like a pearl. To this end, God brings good out of bad. Or another way to say this is that he enables us to see the good of the bad. Do you see the subtle difference there? Here we come again to what we've called antinomies woven into scripture, the both end of scripture. The cross is the ultimate example of this. The cross is legitimately a bad thing, but ultimately we see it as our good. No, this doesn't mean that we th thought it was bad, but it was really good after all. No, the cross remains an evil form of torture, period. 
but yet is at once the source of our redemption. See, this antinomy, this uh, apparent paradox, is so strong that the disciples, if you remember the Gospels, over and over again, Jesus predicts his cross, and they can't fathom how the cross can be something for good. In fact, they block it out. They can't receive it. It's as if he never says it. <laughs> they move on. And he has to say it over and over again. It's not until it happens, in retrospect, that, ah, <laughs> they understand. And this frames this passage for us as well, that God works all things for your good. Now, the pearl does not appear so good at all times. That means you and me. How often do you feel like a pearl in God's eyes? In fact, sometimes are we not actively doing things so to not be conformed according to his image? But yet, all things work together for this ultimate good. There's no qualification here. Bad used for the purpose of good, even, even your occasional rebellion. The end result is all the more glorious because it gives us the reason for gratitude. We're left with nothing but thanksgiving in the end. He gets all the credit, not you or me. The image I'd like to use for this is like a medallion in a Persian rug or a tapestry. So as you understand these designs that we normally see, we see various uh, uh, scroll work that, that ultimately ends in the center medallion, which is very beautiful. But if you were to look closely at only one portion of this rug, you would see lines that don't seem to have any order. They don't seem to be leaving, leading anywhere. Just if you look at the, the medallions over here, you look at the corner of the rug, some, some lines that seem to be just going off on their own with no conclusion. This is what it's like in the midst of our lives. We only see, a, we don't see the big picture. We only see a portion. We see lines that don't seem to have any order or purpose. So have you heard the saying that God writes straight with crooked lines? That might apply here, but I, I have a different saying. No, God makes crooked lines beautiful. I don't know about you, but my life doesn't seem like a straight line. <laughs> so, uh, or actually, no, the saying is God makes straight lines with crooked implements, you know, that you being the implement, you know. Uh, but my, the crooked implement that we are <laughs> does not often make straight lines. No, it makes crooked lines. So. The better analogy, I think, is God makes crooked lines beautiful. So again, we know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now some translations put this in more of the passive voice. Two ways you can render the Greek. All things work together for good. Now, as all things working on their own, so to speak, together for good. So we don't, the idea is that we don't always see God's hand, but of course, this order that miraculously comes out of disorder points to the one who orders all things. We see this in the book of Ruth. Naomi sought protection in a foreign land that was among the Moabites. But while she was there, she lost everything, her husband and her sons. So here she was in a foreign land with no protection. You might call this a crooked line. But even worse, the Moabite woman, Ruth, insists on going back with her as she returns to Bethlehem. Now this, for Naomi, would be the ultimate embarrassment. I went off to a foreign land, I lost my husband, now I bring this foreign woman back with me, who's not part of our people. But then that same Ruth, later on, just happened, the text says, to pick scraps in a field that belonged to a man named Boaz. He was the one relative who could redeem Naomi's line. In this culture, he was called the kinsman redeemer. So 
this word just happened is said in the text with a wink, so to speak. Of course, it was God who ordered this providence. So in the end, we see the child Boaz gave to Naomi through Ruth became an ancestor of David, who was an ancestor of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. That, brothers and sisters, is the middle of the medallion. But none of them could have seen this even in the midst of their lives. Now in our lives, there are times likewise when we don't see the medallion, but only those crooked lines. And there are more, I think both, all of us could come up with more examples of this than we could count. And think, I mean, if, if you were to have some time, you'd, you wouldn't be able to stop thinking of the times where what you thought in the midst of the moment was simply bad. You can look back and say, well, I'm glad that happened to me. Look, look at all the good things that came from that. I think of my dreams dashed when I wasn't accepted into a particular program in college which led me to seek and ultimately um, led, created some momentum that led to my, in, my conversion, seeking Christ. So God's primary aim is not for your comfort, but for your holiness, to make you that beautiful pearl. Now, we all signed up, however, for comfort. That's what we think. So let's get this straight. God's primary aim for you is greater than your mere comfort, but for your holiness, to have your the ultimate desires filled in that pearl. Now, when I was in my summer between 7th and 8th grade, I went for the first time away for a month to Camp Dudley. And in that cabin, in the midst of all our homesickness, I was glad to say, to hear that each cabin will go away for a trip for three days off the campus of the camp to get some break, to get some refreshment. They said, we're gonna go to a country club. Get your tennis racket, they said. So it wasn't until I got into the bus that I realized that I was the only one who had a tennis racket. Well, you see, I was what they called a junior. There's one more year left in the camp, but most of these kids were there since their early elementary years. And so most of them fell for the joke. There is no country club. We were going away into the woods. And what they called the spa was a stream that was ice cold <laughs> that we had to get into. I remember the counselor saying, after the snickers of my fellow campers, you know, it's rare you get a junior who falls for this joke. <laughs> they were all in on it already. <laughs> but likewise for you and me, we fall for the joke as well. Think of the advertisements that try to tell you, oh, you can have a country club. Or the celebrities that we see who seem to have everything. Well, that's for you as well. But you see, we forget that everyone else is in on the joke, uh, or it should be. Uh, we should be, like, you know, it should be rare that someone who, like us, you know, who, are, who come to church or are so ex exposed to scripture, would still fall for this joke. But we're like that junior, the one who, who didn't get the punchline yet. Yeah, the celebrities, how many of them are actually happy that they have all these things? No, there is no country club. You can leave your tennis racket at home. That's not, and here's the thing. Even after that hazing, I can look back, I, I could write a book at how all this was more beneficial than the country club. I mean, how, how memorable would that be? Another trip to the tennis court. But to go into that cold water, to have that character formation, even to be toughened up by, by the ribbing of my fellow campers, all far more beneficial. God does not desire your mere comfort, but your holiness. So what, but the question though remains though, and this, we'll, we'll all encounter this, what about extremely crooked lines that on their own seem to have no redeemable quality at all? You know, there is a medallion, but this does happen at times. And I'm thinking about Admiral Denton, who was tortured in North Vietnam beyond his body or mind could bear, beyond his ability to pray. Or I think of Walter Chiswick, who was brought to his ultimate despair when he failed, when his 
solitary confinement and torture caused him to sign a false statement. He said, why would God allow me to fail? But for both of these men, at the lowest point that they could imagine, that's where grace came. That's where they realized that God would never leave them or forsake them. This is where they found their ultimate holiness. And both of them could point to that moment of the nadir of their life and say, that's where I found my joy. That could never be taken away. And so the question for you and me is, can you embrace this and not be scandalized when trials come? You know, actually, just this morning on the way here, I got a call from Abby and said, you know, somebody knocked off the bumper on our car and didn't tell us about it. You know, I, how can I deal with this? I'm on my way here. And, you know, just, well, I just wanted to tell you how upset I was, you know. I, I was too, you know. You can't, not all things can go through insurance, but through the expense. But even this, I mean, uh, well, this gives me a, a very present example. Well, perhaps somebody will come to us and we'll have an opportunity to share some generosity to them, to show Christ to them that they would not have ever known before. Perhaps this very working of patience will work some holiness in us that we couldn't, have, we couldn't pay for <laughs> with the cost of that bumper, bumper. So God redeems the fallen world by producing heroic sanctity in the midst of our trials. This is the pattern of all his saints, which doesn't, which brings us beyond those extremely crooked lines, but even to unfathomable evil that we can't understand. Now, most of us are very familiar uh, with the story of Tim Ballard and uh, the movie that's, that most of us have seen, The Sound of Freedom. I don't need to share many details from his life, and I'll spare some of them given our mixed company here. But is there anybody else who experienced the futility of hope? That comes from earlier in this passage of the Book of Romans. The, the, the futility of this fallen world, understanding of, of what, would, what, what the, the abuse that had, had happened to the most vulnerable, but then to encounter this evil up close. Is there anyone else further on from what we shared in, in past weeks from the book of Romans who didn't have sufficient prayers, <laughs> no words to say, God, help me for this, but can only simply groan, but yet even in this, we see good out of bad. So St. John Chrysostom asks, when Paul speaks of all things in this passage, all things that work for good, he mentions even the things that are beyond painful. For, and this anticipates the rest of the passage that we won't get to next week, by the way, because it's the Feast of the Transfiguration. But this then Chris Austin points to Romans 8, 38 and 39. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As Chris Austin concludes, this is the instance of his ineffable power. The passage concludes, those he predestined, he also called. I'm just gonna mention this briefly before we conclude here today, because you may have seen this and that may have raised questions in your mind. It's it's part and parcel of this all things that he refers to. Jesus who draws us. He's the one who finds the pearl. Now, this is not an academic question, the question between God's predestination and our free will. It's a question that I asked when I was you know, seeking Christ and wondering if this was all true. I've had someone else come to me recently and say, you know, I want to join the church, but what about this question about predestination and free will? How can they go together? You know, it's, there's a pastoral application to this. We don't need to solve it all. It's another antimony, by the way, both at the same time. Both are true because it emphasizes that you are saved by grace alone. 
You don't bring credit to this. He did it. Then it says, you are justified. He did this to justify you. That was the great price. You were justified by his blood. This is the ultimate good out of bad on the cross. The ultimate crooked line made beautiful so that, Paul says, you might also be glorified. The beautiful pearl in the end. So you didn't find him. He found you. That's why all things work together. God ordering all things, every moment, toward salvation and redemption. And you will remember this if you embrace that you are his pearl of great price. And he loves you enough to turn your bad into good and make your crooked lines beautiful.